great tyranny served up Obama as hope. And we all fell for it. I mean, Obama has done shit that Dick Cheney would be embarrassed by. Okay? And all the little progressives are going, oh, but he's black, so it's okay. Wrong. Okay? So, fuck the crappies. Listen to the message. Um, we have a two-party tyranny in this country, and that is the greatest enemy of the United States of America. Period. Nothing else matters except this two-party tyranny. And as long as we have this two-party tyranny of crooks, and they're just lightweight crooks. I mean, you got a whole bunch of fat, pasty-faced, white assholes that are basically crooks. And they're running this country, and they're discounting the Treasury by 95%. The bridge to now where NSA, I love the keynote speech. I mean, he really, that's the best description I've ever heard of how the U.S. government basically keeps the problem going so the money will keep flowing. And what they're not telling you is that the printing presses are going 24 hours a day. Um, we're borrowing a trillion dollars a year in fake digital money. And basically, these guys are going to go until we burn the Capitol down. And um, Occupy blew it. So do I have a question anywhere? Is there a microphone for questions? I'm not going to sit here and talk extemporaneously for two hours. Uh, I was yes. So you talk a lot about big data and open source intelligence. Um, what are your thoughts on, first of all, Intellipedia, in, what, what do they call it, Intellipedia, the shared thing that at least... High something? school crap. Okay. What are your thoughts about InQtel? Um, freshman in college. Um, you know, I got to tell you, I used to, I used to run a conference until it was stolen from me by Elliot Jardine. He's a dishonorable little shit. Um, he was, he was made the assistant deputy director of national intelligence for open source. And the reason he was picked was a, he was a sergeant who was housebroken and couldn't intimidate a fly. Uh, and second, um, they didn't want me. Um, and he made me two promises. One was that, uh, he would not create a conference that would compete with the one that I had been running for 17 years. And the other was that he would let me help him and he self-destructed in two years, but he took me down with him. Um, I used to have InQtel briefing every year at my conference. And at the same time, I had Steve Arnold, CEO of Arnold IT. And after three or four years, people said, why are we wasting time on InQtel? Okay. I mean, these are people that think Google is cool. Uh, and I'm not impressed. Um, and, and frankly, there's an even deeper underlying problem in all U.S. government research. There's a wonderful open letter to InQtel written by a guy named Paul Fernhout, I think it is. And if you imagine all this money that DARPA is spending on sensors and robots and all this shit to kill people, if we spent this money on desalinating water and poverty and uh, ambient power and all of these other things, it would be a completely different world. In my experience, InQtel doesn't know what it's doing. Um, in my experience, the price of admission to InQtel is to be so housebroken you're out of touch. Um, and I obviously don't have direct inside access, um, but I have never in the last 30 years met a government research and development person who actually had their shit together. Um, they, they, they basically go through the motions and they let the, the contractors write the statements of work and they basically buy whatever the flavor of the day is. Um, I mean, the U.S. government can't build a ship right now. Uh, all of the airplanes in the inventory in the Department of Defense are absolute, utter disasters. I mean, one of them is killing pilots. It's, it's, it's oxygen deprivation. And nobody thought about all the toxic chemicals that come with stealth. Um, you know, one of the things I'm big on is true cost economics. There is nothing economical about the U.S. government. Um, and in Iraq, I mentioned this before, the Fallujah babies. We have put so much depleted uranium down in Afghanistan and Iraq and so many other toxic chemical combinations that not only the indigenous people but our own troops are going to be suffering 
for decades to come. We have 18 suicides a day right now among our veterans, 18, all right? How can any country not know that and not feel the cognitive disconnect? Um, the U.S. intelligence community, of which InQtel is a part, is spending between 80 and 100 billion dollars a year, okay? Now, General Tony Zinni, St. Cent, and I'm sure he regrets the day I ever heard it, but uh, Tony Zinni is on record as saying that as commander of CENTCOM, he got less than 4%, 4% at best of what he needed to know. And most of you know I've been fighting the U.S. government since 1988 for an open source agency. We may be getting closer to that day, but it will not be part of the intelligence community. Um, I've written an article in Counterpunch called Intelligence for the President and Everyone Else. Um, it's a fairly straightforward piece. But uh, turning back to the keynote, and if you didn't hear the keynote guy, go buy the tape. It's surely worth $10, um, the DVD. Uh, he laid it all out. The U.S. government is not here to serve you. The U.S. government, which is good people trapped in a bad system, is all about spending money for stakeholders, and it doesn't matter what the money buys as long as Congress gets a 5% kickback. And that's the standard kickback on the Hill. You don't need a napkin. Cunningham was just a little sleazier than the rest of them. 5% earmarked. Back to you. So, any other questions here? Uh, any thoughts about doors and their tendency to revolve? It's a very profound question. Um, I'd like to refer you to Will and Ariel Durant's The Story of Civilization in 11 volumes. Oh, that revolving. I'm sorry. Here I thought you were being a smart ass. Uh, <laughs> All the other smart people thought so, too. Uh, okay, so revolving doors, yes. That, you know, that's, that's a great question because I, you know, I've, I've learned a lot in the last 10 or 15 years, and I think that, that Robert McNamara and um, Bill Colby and I are examples of people who learn more after they leave government than when they were in government. First off, if I were God, and you quit the government to go work for a contractor, you would lose your clearances. And you would not come back to work as a contractor for the U.S. government. Uh, one of the things we've done over the last few years with all this outsourcing and this corrupt money practice is we've diminished the capacity of the government to think. Um, I mean, InQtel is a minor example. Uh, CIA analysts, they're children. Uh, and the assumption is still that because they're being spoon-fed secrets, they're somehow going to intuit crap. Well, you know, I still remember the Queen of Sheba that went to the Netherlands. They're still laughing at her. Uh, she stormed into the Netherlands thinking she was great because she was the Dutch analyst. And inside of five minutes, they knew she didn't speak Dutch. She'd never read a Dutch history book in any language. Uh, and she had no fucking clue what was going on in the Netherlands. Um, you can't substitute technology for thinking. And the U.S. government has become stupid, uh, as well as unethical at the highest levels. I mean, what we're doing with rendition and extrajudicial killing and drones, and this is all crap. I mean, CIA should be burned to the ground and salt plowed in. Uh, they've got 2,000 people there whose sole job is to figure out how to target a drone to kill a bus driver taking a crap by the side of the road. Okay, because that's the signature. Oh, he's crouching by the side of the road. You know, he must be planting an IED, an improvised electronic device. Come on. Nobody is holding us accountable for being decent human beings or thoughtful human beings. So revolving door, I personally feel that people should be incentivized to work a full career in government, and they should lose their retirement pay uh, if they work for a contractor period. It's time we had a government of, by, and for the people, not a government that is a stop. And look at Congress. All of these congressmen are millionaires by the end of their first term, 
And all of them now are actually planning for post-Congress K Street lobbyist jobs. I mean, if I were God, uh, Congress would be like jury duty. We would randomly select from among the citizens because I absolutely guarantee you, any one of you in this room would be a better congressman than the shit we have today. Um, and so, revolving door has got to go. Um, I mean, public service is a very honorable thing when it's done right. Uh, so, to take your serious question seriously, slam that fucker on their dicks and lock it down. <laughs> the women are, of course, perfect. Uh, <laughs> we won't go there. Okay. Do we still have the Robert Steele drinking game? No, oh, this is a whole new generation. <laughs> Lightweights. Okay. Another question. Yes, sir. Um, uh, two years ago when you're here, I think we spent like a lot of time when we weren't talking about spy sex, of course. Uh, we were talking about um, the ideology, uh, sorry, the ideology of uh, terrorism. Now, a big difference between two years ago and now is the whole Arab Spring. So I, I have I guess a two-part question. One, what do you think the impact is going to be of, of basically the people overthrowing uh, dictatorships that were very beneficial to uh, the Western governments? And then two, I know there's a big push there for democracy right now. Is it going to be the representative democracy where uh, the minorities and the little people are okay? Or is it going to be the type of tyranny of the majority against the minority type of democracy? Um, and whatever comments you have on that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Um, it's always been a, a troubling point for me that the U.S. is best pals with 42 of the 44 dictators on the planet. Uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton is a hypocrite. Uh, she walks around lecturing Burma on democracy. We don't have democracy here in the United States. Uh, nor, for that matter, do we have freedom of speech and, and, uh, and movement. Um, so let's first establish the fact that the United States government loves dictators. And that's a huge ethical as well as practical mistake. Uh, dictators are not good for anybody. Now, I think the Arab Spring caught everybody by surprise. And, and CIA will, of course, claim they've been planning it for years and... Uh, this is the end game and blah, blah, blah. And of course, you may remember that, that uh, General Clark has gone on record in video as saying that when we invaded Iraq, there was already plans in place to take over the entire Middle East, to basically roll seven countries. Um, and I think that's true. But the US idea of rolling a country is to basically invade it and assume that they will welcome us as liberators. I mean, the degree of delusion in, in, in Washington is, to my mind, amazing. And I'm often reminded of Daniel Ellsberg, his book, Secrets, a memoir, is a very good book. And in there, he talks about how he came back from Vietnam and he was talking to Henry Kissinger. And he was lecturing because he was saying, Henry, if you get all caught up with all these top secret, sensitive compartment and information reports and stuff, you're going to become like a moron. Those are Ellsberg's words. He's absolutely right. I mean, you look at General Hayden, General Alexander, they are completely out of touch with reality. They really think that spending $15 billion is going to somehow fix things. It's not. They're basically creating a big fucking hole uh, for the rest of the country to fall into. Um, and it troubles me because I know Alexander and I know Hayden and they're, they're, they're decent human beings who have been so overpromoted, the Peter Principle looks like a speck of, you know, sand down here. These guys have no business going beyond major. Um, and, and even there, I wouldn't let them out at night. Um, so we, we have some real issues here with the United States system of promoting people. Now, <clears throat> the Tunisian fruit seller I, I was in Vietnam as a kid. I was in Vietnam for about 10 monk burnings and 10 coup d'etats. I used to trade cigarettes for bullets and then once almost burned down a golf course. But uh, magnifying glass and gunpowder and 12-year-old kids is not a good mix. Um, what? 
But no, you know, I just didn't realize grass would burn fast. <laughs> Ooh. But it was really cool because I was out in the middle of the field, you know, and I thought I was all alone, and it started burning, and like, as I remember it, 50 Vietnamese popped out of the grass. And, you know, <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> Where were these fuckers? <laughs> so I'd say, if you haven't read the book, The Tunnels of Kuchi, it is absolutely the best book on how Americans consistently underestimate these little scrawny brown people that have big balls, okay? Uh, yeah, exactly. Which, look, I mean, somebody smarter than me said never fight a war on the Asian landmass. And both the Russians and the Americans screwed that one up. Um, Yeah, but you know, the bottom line here is we are spending so much time, and there's a lot of good books on, on how Lockheed Martin actually created the Cold War. Um, but going, coming back to this thing about the Arab Spring, it's not gonna be a traditional democracy. And one of the reasons it's not gonna be a traditional democracy is because there are some cultural disconnects. Where we have failed, where the United States of America has failed since we won the good war, World War II, is we have failed to focus on education, not only of our own people, but of everyone else. And so what you have right now is, is religious zealotry as a substitute for education. And so you have a lot of these disconnected paths and I'm very pleased with what happened in the Middle East, and unfortunately, Israel is still the sucking chest wound there. And I don't mean Israel as a country. I mean the Zionists uh, that believe in assassinations and ghettoizing the Palestinians and denying that the Palestinians were ever there. If you go back and look at the biblical maps, Palestine, and Gandhi said this, Palestine is to the Palestinians as France is to the French. Um, I believe it has to be a two-country solution. I believe that uh, Gaza and... Um, is it Jericho? Basically, we have to, we have to give them a, contigu a contiguous area of land. And if I were God, I would turn off the money for Israel. We're paying 20% of their government budget right now. Um, and and I, would re I would also turn off all of the money we're giving to the Arab dictators, or we're giving to the Arab dictators. I would create a regional water authority because Israel right now is stealing the water from the Arabs with these very long pipes, okay? Chuck Spinney's put up a marvelous briefing on, on, on water in the Middle East. Um, the Dead Sea is coming alive. A very fine academic research program went into the Dead Sea and created the original furrows from historical, from biblical times, and got to the point where every drop of rain was captured and they're now growing lemons and figs in the Dead Sea, okay? So there's some really amazing stuff that can happen. Now, coming back to the Arab Spring, I believe that open BTS is gonna become a reality here in the next five years. Um, I personally think uh, Sailor's delusional if he thinks smartphones are gonna reach the five billion poor. But what you can do is, uh, what you can do is give the five billion poor the shittiest Nokia phone on the planet and uh, a call center and educate them one call at a time. And so I, I, I see real promise in this idea of free education, uh, one call at a time. And I'm now at a point, I'm 60 years old, and I was talking to my middle son in the car, trying to get a sense, he's sort of a philosopher. I, I've got a, a techno geek at the Rochester Institute of Technology, I've got a kind of philosopher, businessman, if you take my meaning and um, then my son is my football jock. And I said, so, so what do you think? And he said, oh, we're just waiting for all you old guys to die. <laughs> there was a lot of wisdom <laughs> in that statement. Uh, so I, th I think it's gonna work out. I've done everything I could, and now it's time for me to go buy a sailboat and, and chill out uh, with a water maker and solar power and get off the grid. Um, so I'm very excited by, by the, the promise of the future. And if you want to read one book or one review of one book about why education is the single most important duty of the state, uh, I recommend Will Durant's 1916 doctoral thesis, uh, Philosophy and the Social Problem.
and it's now out in an annotated edition, which is just, if you just read my summary, because I gave all of my books away when I joined the UN, and, um, and so those summaries are my cliff notes for smart people. Um, and and that, that's a really, really good book. Yes, sir. Hey, thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> and, I know you're, and I know you're not a sir. Um, uh, okay, this is a bad question, but I have to say, are you familiar with a CIA agent named Chase Brandon who re recently published a book called Cryptos Conundrum, which is a fictional book about Roswell? But he, Chase Brandon is a CIA agent who was for like and By the way, years. CIA, Case Brandon is a case officer. Agents commit treason, case officers recruit them and handle them and terminate them, which means give them money to go away. It doesn't mean kill them. Um, and Chase Brandon is probably one of the last people at CIA that actually speaks two languages. Um, and in his case, it's an obscure dialect from the Peruvian Indians. Um, and they've been trotting him out at Camp Perry for every single class going back the last 20 years uh, as, oh, this is our guy that speaks this Indian dialect that nobody else knows. Um, but they can't speak German or French or, or um, Gaelic. Uh, anyway, I do know Chase. Um, I'll look at the book. Um, Chase is a serious guy. He's a good case officer. Um, I haven't seen him or heard from him in 20 years. Uh, Use the microphone for everybody in the back. I mean, and I'm happy to have a back and forth dialogue. I want you guys to have fun. I don't know if he's just trying to like promote his new book, but his whole thing now is like, oh, I was at Roswell and it wasn't man-made spacecraft. He's not giving any definitive yes or no, whether it was UFO or not. Not that I'm going to start a whole UFO dialogue this early in the night, but like... I'm, I'm with you. But like he's... But, I was just on Pluto. Okay, well that's good. But uh, I'm and just they curious. were all naked. <laughs> I'm just trying to get a take on the guy, like as a, as a human no, look, being. As a human being, Chase Brandon is a decent human being. Um, and look, governments around the world are starting to declassify all their UFO files. I mean, there is absolutely no question that a whole bunch of technology became available in the 50s and the 60s, and it was locked up. Um, Basically, governments have screwed the people, uh, and we've allowed businesses to get away with shit that is just outrageous. Now, there are at least a hundred planets with life on it, okay? At least a hundred uh, other planets with some form of intelligent life, hopefully one that hasn't acquired nuclear weapons. Um, I actually heard a, a UFO guy on, on uh, one, of the, one of the intelligent channels a few years ago, and he said he thought that a number of these nuclear mishaps, like the plane that was taking nuclear weapons toward the Middle East and then it kind of had to go down and that revealed the whole thing and it took that off the table. He actually thinks some of this is contrived, perhaps by extraterrestrial intelligence. I don't know. I personally would like to think it's insiders that still have integrity. Um, but he said something that I thought was very interesting, which is that Earth could be quarantined uh, because we're nuts, or at least the U.S. is nuts. Yeah, and, and, and it's... Anyway, so as far as Chase goes, if I, if I happen to see the book, I don't read fiction very often, but, uh, but I would say to you that one of the things that's going to happen in the next five to ten years is we're going to... Real, first, we're going to know with absolute certainty who killed Kennedy. Uh, we're going to know who killed Martin Luther King. There are great books out on that now. And I'd be glad to answer questions oh, about. Do you know that stuff now? Yeah, uh, but 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 I charge for the answers. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Actually, I'll give you my personal view based on books by others. And don't ever think that this is Robert Steele running his mouth with his opinion. Everything I say is rooted in the thoughts of others. Um, so uh, Chase is a good person. I'm glad he survived. Um, but I will tell you, I was hired by the Special Operations Command in 1997 to identify and evaluate 396 terrorist sites in 29 languages CIA did not speak, okay, including Gaelic and Catalan and Polish. It turns out the Poles were the front guys for the Soviets and a lot of terrorist stuff. So the reality is the U.S. government doesn't speak foreign languages. 
It disrespects open sources of information. Um, it, it, it's, it's in this cloud, um, and it's, it's not very effective. Uh, as far as extraterrestrial stuff, I mean, we've got enough problems here on Earth, so I'm not really thinking about it very much. Um, but um, see, Rule by Secrecy, Jim Mars's book. Yeah, it is a great book, and I gave it a rave review, but I very deliberately did not include his conclusion about the aliens and stewards and the Illuminati and all that stuff, uh, because I did not want to detract from the rest of the book, and, and that stuff is, is on the edge. Uh, so anybody ask me a question about 9-11 or JFK or whatever? All right, everybody shout out, what do you really want to know tonight? 9-11 What? 9-11 conspiracy, it's not a conspiracy if it's true. You know, two years ago, or, or no, it wasn't you guys. I, was, I spoke in New York two year, uh, a couple years ago. I said, look, what I want is Larry Silverstein's calendar for the 90 days before 9-11. You give me that calendar, I will nail his ass to the wall, okay? Larry Silverstein is the key to all of this. And if citizen investigative journalism can identify every move by Larry Silverstein, every call, every trip, whatever, in the 90 days prior to 9-11, you've got the whole thing. Yes, sir. Uh, along the same lines as the, the Arab Spring, um, it seems like Russia, which, you know, they, they had their revolt in the, the 90s and went to a more democratic society, it seems like a good portion of the population wants to go back to, like, an authoritative uh, society. And, you know, right now there's, there's protests against it, but it doesn't seem to be, like, a vast majority of the population. Uh, I don't know, whatever commentary you have on what's going on you in know, Russia. You know, people want structure. I, I gave a ride to a Marine one day at Camp Pendleton, gave him a ride to the gate, and he was Hispanic, and we were talking Spanish. That's what Hispanics talk. Um, and, um, and I said, how do you like it? And he said, sir, I got too much free time. Because, you know, you go through boot camp and every minute of every day is programmed and you come out of boot camp a rock, okay? I mean, your body is godly. But then you get into the FMF and you end up sitting around for three or four hours. Guys start drinking, the better ones start copying music and doing other things, and um, the, the bottom line is the military is very unstructured. Um, it's got too much free time. Now, in Russia, you know, I, I got to tell you, I'm high on Putin um, in the sense that I believe, let me just list the countries. And I said this to Scowcroft, and it went ear, in one ear and out the other. Nothing the United States does matters unless we can develop a multinational information sharing and sense making grid that allows Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Iran, Russia, Venezuela, and wild cards like Nigeria and Turkey to get it right, okay? We've basically fucked the earth for the last 50 years, um, and we haven't learned anything from it. So there's some real opportunities here. Uh, and I believe that the, the shortest path to a prosperous world at peace is to give every single one of the five billion poor a free cell phone for life. Um, and before I lost everything in the crash, I funded the Earth Intelligence Network, and that was our basic conclusion. Um, there isn't enough money on the planet to confiscate and redistribute. It doesn't work that way. You literally have to create a shitload of new wealth, and you also have to eradicate waste. I mean, Jay-Z might be here. Liskowitz, are you in here? Okay. Um, but he did a, he did a one-year study on the true cost of a T-shirt. And... Um, you know, when people start to realize that there's, there's 500 gallons of water, there's X number of toxins, there's 17 hours of child labor, there's uh, $2 million in tax avoidance, uh, stuff like that, the market can start to move markets. Right now we have very uneducated consumers. Um, and I think that as information becomes more freely available, it's, it's going to change. It's going to change everything. Uh, but my bottom line is the schools are broken, the universities are trash. Um, I'm actually encouraging my 10th grader to test out, uh, which does not do me a lot of good with my wife. But, um, but he's right, school is stupid. Uh, he's got better things to do with his time. Sir. Uh, 
I'd like to invite us imagining, planning for the public ceremoniously withdrawing their consent from the whole corrupt bunch of institutions, our government, and begin planning now, creating that alternative. But along the lines of revolution by baseball cap, I wanted to present to you the possibility of a, a first fee. Of a what? <laughs> Let's replace our corrupt government. Replace is a very nice word. Um, thank you. Um, I, when I spoke to Occupy, I was hoping that we could get to a general strike. My original, how many people have seen the video of me six minutes in Occupy? Okay, if you look up Steel Occupy, no, uh, Steel Occupy uh, election reform, you'll get right to it. It's six minutes, another guy taped it. Um, I personally believe there is still time to have an electoral reform summit and to actually put forward a slate of candidates, a coalition cabinet, and to demand of Congress a, um, an electoral reform act. And I believe that Occupy should occupy the home offices of every senator and representative. And I believe that the country should go on general strike from the 4th of July onward. Well, all right, it's a little late, I'm a little retro here. But I believe that the, 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 the country can and should go on a general strike. Uh, you know, you want to see a day without Mexicans, how about a day without white people? Uh, this is going to be serious. Um, so, and again, I stress, the government is good people trapped in a bad system. Uh, no one ever gets fired from the government. Um, and uh, I've been reading a lot of RFPs lately, and, and I'm reading all the things that they're saying the contractor has to do. I'm saying, I said, well, well, fine, what's the government doing? Evidently, the government is simply throwing money against the wall and, and hiring contractors willy-nilly. Sir. I was uh, wondering your thoughts on the Bin Laden assassination, <laughs> how, they, how they handled the body. <laughs> okay. I tried to tell Jim Fallows of the Atlantic Monthly that, that this was a fraud. Um, and um, he didn't talk to me for six months. Um, but I will tell you that I'm pretty sure Bin Laden died in 2001. And we've had like six Bin Ladens since then. And if you look at the photos of the various Bin Ladens, I mean, there's a little chubby-cheeked guy. And, you know, there's, there's, and finally, of course, we have Bin Laden and Bert Laden. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure bin Laden died in 2001. Uh, one of the things people don't realize is that one year prior to this so-called operation, and, and, and <laughs> the idiocy of all concerned is just beyond belief. One year prior to this Atlabad operation, Blackwater was known to be in that town and moving around. And every Pakistani in that town knew that Blackwater was in town. I believe they were in town to set up a couple of safe houses. And, and it doesn't occur to these guys that a big hulking asshole with tattoos somehow stands out uh, in Pakistan. Um, but I believe that they set up this safe house, and this is my personal speculation. I believe they set up this safe house, they brought in a guy that was bin Laden's height, and they set them up there with, with wives and, and kids and stuff, and they basically lied to the Joint Special Operations Command uh, and got the Joint Special Operations Command to do something which is totally fucking insane, which is fly a long way from a land country to another land country with a bunch of SEALs who, who don't do well when they're very far from water. Um, and, you know, what is going on here? So I think it was insane. And all of this so-called treasure trove of intelligence, bullshit. Um, so I actually think that uh, the president and the Pentagon were deceived. I personally believe that CIA, and, and when I say CIA, you've got to remember there's at least five CIAs. And within CIA, there are individuals who believe they're above the law. Um, and that probably certainly includes Leon Panetta. Um, and so I believe this was all set up as a politically oriented masterstroke. Um, and it just went nuts. I mean, 
first off, you can't do a DNA test in less than 12 hours, okay? And, and the idea that they were able to do a DNA test and confirm the body, this is all crap. And then to have the body disappear into the ocean? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Who are we kidding? If it really was Bin Laden, they'd have his head on a fucking spike in front of the White House. Um, so my personal view is this was a massive fabrication. I do not believe that JSOG was a party to the fabrication. I take them very seriously. I think they're good people who do the best they can. But intel in this town sucks. Um, and uh, when it's too good to be true, it probably is. Another question. So how much of this do you think is actually just endemic of the fact that we've transitioned to a service-based society and that we're not holding our service provider accountable for what we should be getting? So service providers in general will always provide you the bare minimum service that they can at the lowest cost that they can despite no matter what you actually paid for. You know, if you, if you buy internet service from Verizon, they're going to try to give you the minimum amount of bandwidth that they can to satisfy what, you're, you, know, what you bought from them. And if you don't check, who's to know, what you're, you know that you're getting what you're getting? If, if the, the society at large is not actually holding our government accountable for what they're doing, then you know, even violent revolution is not going to really change that if the, the actual people in the society don't want to think about or really know about anything that happens and hold their service provider accountable for the services that they're getting. So I mean like even you know the government contractors thing, that's because you know a lot of that's because Congress has frozen pay in DOD for God knows how long and they're leaving, they're jumping ship to get higher well, pay. I, I will tell you candidly, I think government is overpaid. Um, I, mean, I mean upper government you know, certainly like the executive branch, but the, the grunts are the no, students beyond that come G, in to beyond do the work. GS 13, I think we're making too much money. And, and the SESs are picking up $20,000 bonuses once a quarter. CIA had so much money it couldn't spend that it created 21 companies, cover companies, and had to close 20 of them because they don't know how to run a business. Um, this is all open source. If there's anyone here from the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, I assure you, I'm not saying anything secret. Um, and they started paying living allowances for all of their people across the United States of America, which has never been done in the past. What? Is someone having an orgasm back there? I, mean, I don't want to miss it. Um, okay. So, so <laughs> what, what, what I, what I, you know, I got to remember, I was a Reagan, I was actually nominated by Reagan to be a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, and I had no idea the shit that was going on. I had no idea that borrowing a trillion dollars a year started in the Reagan administration. Um, so I've been very tuned out, um, and we have a real problem because the entire corporate media is, is completely captive. I mean, I... Once in a while, I, I stumble across CNN when Gupta is sitting there with, with his uh, charismatic face asking really fucking stupid questions. Uh, I mean, and he's the most intelligent of all of them. Uh, the, the media that we have today, I mean, I, I read the New York Times and people forget. I mean, the New York Times reporters, it's like no one's checking them to actually connect to stuff that happened 50 years ago or 25 years ago, even five years ago. Um, so we, we get the government we deserve. And unfortunately, and I, I said this the other day, it goes back to the 1920s. I think there was a decisive downward turn in the United States in the 1920s when Rockefeller and Carnegie did two big things. They bought up all the public transportation companies in order to put them out of business and they created a school system intended to create docile factory workers. Um, and unfortunately, that's what we've gotten. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I've given up, uh, I've done everything I could to try and save 2012, and nobody's listening. Uh, so I, I gotta go sail. Uh, but uh, bottom line here is if and when the public gets smart, it could start thinking about things like tax boycotts, uh, it could start thinking about things like uh, really terrorizing its congressional representatives. I mean, I think the, the point that I'm trying to make is the fact that the, the government that we have and a lot of the other stuff that's going on is really just a symptom of the problem and not the actual problem itself. 
right? So you have a large population that either for whatever reason don't care or don't want to think for themselves and they just take whatever they've been conditioned to, to basically be fed. And you don't, there's nothing you can really do to even try to get them to think about something else. And if they don't think about anything else and they, they, they just take whatever's in front of them, they follow blindly for whatever's in front of them and they don't hold anybody else accountable for anything else that's happening and instead just get rage and... What scares me more than anything is the degree to which America has become polarized between two extremes, both of which are completely stupid. Uh, but I mean, I, I was at a, uh, when I was up in New Hampshire, I actually qualified to be in one of the presidential presentations there. And, um, and I was talking to some guy who believed that Rick Santorum was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I said something critical, and he looked at me like I was a fucking terrorist. Uh, and I realized this guy is an idiot, <laughs> dressed up to look like a rich businessman. Uh, and we've got too many of these people in the United States. Um, and of course, money now, uh, Citizens United. So I don't know what the answer is, but I, I, I can say with certainty that, that the government is full of good people trapped in a bad system, and the U.S. is over the cliff and on the way down. Um, and I think, and here's kind of my best answer, is if my wife didn't have a government job, I'd be living in Maine now. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I think localized resilience, including urban farming, is where we're going to have to end up. And it's going to get to the point where most of these cities, including New York City, are going to die. Um, uh, New York City probably should become five different cities. With, uh, with big swaths of restored agriculture uh, between them. Sir. A uh, buddy, buddy of mine uh, turned me on this a couple months ago. Um, what are your thoughts on the chemtrail uh, conspiracy stuff? Mm. I, I am not well enough informed to, to really render a, a judgment other than to say that I've been persuaded that fluoride was a huge mistake. Um, yeah, I agree on that. And and again, you know, Herman Daly's uh, an old one-armed professor now uh, in, uh, out of the University of Maryland. He's emeritus. He's the guy who invented true cost economics. And, and I recommend all of his books, including his eco ecological economics primer. Um, if you're a thinking human being who is willing to actually look for the truth, you can tell what the true cost is of everything. Uh, I mean, there's a book called Pandora's Poison, which is what's the price we pay for having chlorine and plastic as the basis for our entire civilization. Um, there are a whole bunch of books on toxins and all your household goods and, and stuff like that. So my bottom line is I'm not, I'm not willing to say that chemtrails are a conspiracy. I am willing to say that the U.S. government, state governments, and corporations have been irresponsible to the point of being guilty of war crimes deserving of a Nuremberg trial uh, against we the people. Yep. Nice. Thank you for your service. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, okay, in 2010, we were talking about the... Uh... I'm gonna start calling on people if he comes up one more time. <laughs> I'll be up more than I'll be up more than one more time. Uh, the the B collapse we were talking about in 2010 about the colony B collapse thing, and you were at that point you were saying it was due to cell phone towers, but it seems to be it's actually due to Monsanto, MSO, oh, you know, oh, like oh, fucking oh. that stuff killing those bees. So like, can you tell us anything about Monsanto and like killing the bees and like? How awful is Monsanto? <laughs> Go. <laughs> I love Monsanto. I mean, I, they're a national treasure. <laughs> um, the concept of a suicidal seed is so mind-boggling to me. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the problems we're having is that Monsanto seeds are spreading over to farmers that don't want them. And Monsanto is basically using the law. Um, I mean, part of the problem we have in the U.S. today is that the law is out of control. Uh, the Supreme Court has completely lost it. 
uh, Citizens United. And in fact, it wasn't, uh, as I understand it, this whole corporate personality thing was not decided that way by the court. It was actually a mistake in the reporting. And then Justice Powell spent 20 years building up towards Citizens United. Uh, I'm serious. I mean, Justice Powell has, with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, been working toward that decision uh, for 20 years. Um, so it's possible to understand true costs. And it's possible to understand that, that Monsanto's seeds are a death wish uh, for the rest of us. And there are governments now that are banning uh, genetically modified foods, and they're, they're, they're being very, very scrupulous. Scrupulous? Whatever. Um, so again, one of the frustrations I have is that all corporations operate under a public charter. But one of the things I learned from Carl Deplinger, who's one of the Tea Party founders, is that we suffer from something that's called control fraud. Control fraud is when your government turns a blind eye to high crimes and misdemeanors. And the US government has chosen in the last 10 or 15 years to basically turn a blind eye to all manner of financial, uh, engineering. I mean, uh, Charles Perrow has written an excellent book called The Next Catastrophe. I mean, there's a chlorine tank sitting above the New Jersey Turnpike just waiting for a pissed off um, uh, guy from New York City uh, to, to, um, to pop it. And, and imagine that. Um, what we do to ourselves is beyond belief. And um, I, I personally, if I were God, I would not punish Monsanto. I would expose them. Uh, I think the only answer, the only nonviolent answer that's sustainable is get the information in front of the people. And one of the problems we have is we don't have enough true cost uh, surveys. If I were a professor, every one of my students would have to complete a true cost survey on anything, a pen, a jar, a piece of glass, whatever, uh, because that's what's missing. We're missing the true cost information. Once that true cost information breaks out into the public consciousness, these corporations will shit to change. Yeah, sir. Oh, when you were mentioning extraterrestrials, I couldn't help but think of a George Carlin routine. He's going, not, in the not too distant past, we were, ba we were crucifying each other, conducting human sacrifices, setting ourselves on, ch on fire, and continue to do some pretty atrocious things to each other, but we're still in the dark as to why aliens don't want to come on down and visit us. <laughs> They're here in this room. <laughs> and I know their names. <laughs> what do you consider the most benign source of concentrated energy to replace petroleum as we pass peak oil, especially with China and India coming online? Uh, there seem to be problems with most of the, uh, the options, uh, uh, mountain top, mountain top uh, strip mining, removal strip mining right, is right, bad. Right, right, right. There's the first coal, off, coal, coal, uh, tar sands are bad. Nukes can give us what we had in, in Japan. Demand, yeah. demand has collapsed in the United States. I mean, Keystone is a fraud because what Keystone is all about is basically using water we don't have to flush tar sands and then piping this crap all the way across the United States instead of building a refinery there so that the old legacy refineries can refine this crap and export it, okay? There is absolutely nothing in Keystone that has anything to do with domestic demand, all right? And, you know, Congress knows this, but uh, anyway, my answer is decentralized, localized energy production. These wind farms are idiocy, but local wind and local solar power uh, and, and creating neighborhood grids uh, and, of course, redesigning stuff. Um, you know, I was, I was starting to say earlier, I'm a real fan of Russell Acoff and Buckminster Fuller. And uh, Acoff on design and, and Buckminster Fuller on design is really spectacular. When you really think about it, it's possible to build a house that has self-contained sewage and self-contained water. Um, and can be powered completely with whatever renewable sources are in that particular neighborhood. Um, so when we created the Earth Intelligence Network, one of the things I did was, was uh, take the 10 threats that the uh, UN high-level panel had picked, uh, poverty on down, and then I looked through all the mandate for change books and I went and I identified 12 policies, agriculture, uh, diplomacy, um, 
uh, economy, education, energy, family, health, immigration, justice, security, and society, uh, and uh, water. You know, the Office of Management and Budget hasn't managed anything ever. But in the 1970s, they, they made a very specific decision that they would just be the green eyeshade types and move the money. And there's absolutely no coherence and there's no evidence-based reasoning behind any policy that the U.S. government pursues. Uh, it's all about ideology and paying off campaign contributors and, and, and basically the cabinet secretaries are there to serve the people who get the taxpayer money, not the taxpayers themselves. Uh, so my general sense, and again, I'm, I'm kind of captive because my wife has a good job and it's going to last at least another four years and it may be that she has to work for another 10 years uh, if the U.S. government doesn't collapse. Um, which, I'll tell you what, there's some scary shit coming down in 2013 and 2014. We are in big doo-doo. Uh, well, how many of you think the unemployment rate is 8%? It's 22.4%. And in my demographic, it's 40%. And in the young kids coming out of really stupid colleges, it's 40%. Okay, the number of kids living at home is, is incredible. Um, 46 million on food stamps. Uh, middle class is gone. Um, basically, Obama has been a placeholder. Uh, and Everything the U.S. government and the media are telling you is intended to get us to November without us freaking out. And once we get there, then Israel can attack Iran, um, build more settlements. Um, the president has already put in place what he needs in order to do uh, price controls and food rationing and water control. Um, I'm very concerned. Now, the one good bright side is they figured out the Halliburton camps won't work. Um, and so... Where are we all going to live then? <laughs> we're going to start a war and we're going to lower our standards. Fat old guys can still join. Well, I don't know, but I'm very concerned. I think 2013, 2014 are going to be perhaps catalysts for mass action. I don't know. I really don't. What I do know is the government is lying to us today uh, about virtually everything. Uh, and, um, you know, that's a problem. I, there's a guy in New York, Bob Seabird or something. He says, uh, no matter how ugly it is, until you get the truth on the table, you can't deal with it. Well, Washington is all about postponing decisive action and postponing decisive understanding. Uh, you really have got to get a grip on reality if you want to sustain. Um, follow up? Um, on, yeah, on the UFO topic, um, John B. Alexander and Richard Dolan are in consensus that there is some sort of genuine extraordinary phenomenon going on involving machines not built by any nation of this world that have been turning up for decades. Um, but they reach different conclusions about the role the government is playing. Uh, John B. Alexander, who has many connections in aerospace, uh, finds that every agency seems to think that another agency is the one that's centralized uh, repository for the information. And the conclusion he reaches is that the government has bungled UFO research just like, just like they bungled so much else. And nobody's actually in charge. And a lot of data is being lost on what is a genuinely significant phenomenon. Uh, Richard Dolan had done a very let's make it quick because yeah, you got a long time had, had done a very level-headed study regarded by many as like the best book on UFO uh, the history of the UFO phenomenon, and yet has recently claimed uh, come a, to the point a, a, a elaborate black budget projects a breakaway civilization. Uh, where do you stand? <sighs> <laughs> I'm thinking. Um, First off, it, it's characteristic of the U.S. government to bungle stuff. Um, and, and uh, I mean, one of the reasons I don't think we're any further ahead is because the Air Force ended up being the first one to deal with extraterrestrials. Uh, and that was a huge mistake. Uh, huh? No, I, I, don't get me started on Army Pentecostals. Um, uh, 
You know, there's some real serious shit going on in this country. I mean, there's like three coup d'etats starting in 9-11 and working their way forward. Um, one of the things that, that I've seen is that we have spent an awful lot of money building some very big tunnels. Um, and uh, there are actually some books I haven't had time to buy and read, but, but I think there is a whole underground USA. Um, and I have no idea who gets to go there or, or, or what. But what most people don't realize is what the rich realized in the 1920s in New York City is when the shit hits the fan, if we're not all able to cope with it, the ones who have their little hideaways aren't going to last very long. Um, and so this is an all-in kind of thing. Um, I would say that there are a number of very serious technologies, including energy weapons that vaporized uh, the towers here in New York City, um, with maybe small Coke can-sized nuke devices as well. Uh, this is why I would like Larry Silverstein's head on a platter. Um, but there have been technologies, and some of them may actually be in use today. I mean, we may have some, some stealth uh, craft uh, that are way beyond drones. Um, but those are very narrowly, narrowly managed. I mean, if, if, if you want to get an example of how stupid the Air Force is, just look up Gorgon Stare. Uh, you know, it's, it's a drone with 50 eyeballs. And uh, the Air Force insists that what's taken by those eyeballs can only be looked at by a U.S. citizen with secret clearances. Okay, so I've got a whole bunch of guys in India at $5 a day dying for work, and the U.S. Air Force can't process these 50 things. And oh, by the way, bandwidth is more expensive than pilots. Um, so I, I would say there is definitely some technology that has been withheld from the public that may be exploited uh, by an agency here and there. Uh, but by and large, the default for the U.S. government is always assume mass incompetence. Sir? Uh, the last few decades, the United States had a war on drugs, which has obviously failed. Now, in the last No, wait, it was very successful. In We've brought in more drugs more efficiently than ever before in history, and we single-handedly turned Afghanistan around. What is your problem? Uh, the, USA! <laughs> the last couple years, we've seen an order of magnitude more deaths in Mexico than we have in other war fronts. Do you see the, the, the cartel war in Mexico eventually spilling over to the United States? Well, I think it already has. I, one of the things, uh, in the Arizona, I think our own cops killed those guys. Um, a, there are an awful lot of people in the United States that die without a trace. Um, and, and I don't think we really have a grip on just how false the, the calm is above the, uh, above the thing. Um, Mexico, <sighs> see part, part of the problem is, is the war on drugs is, is a very conflicted war. I mean, some of you have seen me in The Great White Hope, um, which completely surprised me uh, in terms of getting around. DEA and CIA run drugs into the United States of America. And uh, they, they very specifically and deliberately let major drug dealers do whatever they want uh, as, as, uh, as a cost of doing business. Um, so from where I sit, nothing happens in this country that isn't actually tacitly approved by the U.S. government. Um, and so all of this stuff is part of keeping the people down. Uh, and uh, in Mexico, it's not just Mexico. Uh, when I was in Guatemala, we were starting to see all of the processing factories move up from Colombia and into Honduras and Nicaragua. Um, Costa Rica is still holding them back, and this is a country without an army. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I hope you own a gun. Uh, do you think that the, the media is going to go from concentrating on the Middle East to concentrating on what's going on in The Central media America? doesn't have a brain. It can't concentrate on anything. I mean, there's, there's no media in this country. Uh, in fact, even, even looking on the web, it's hard to find 
uh, serious reporting on anything. Um, I mean, I, I used to publish, it, it had 6,000 readers, including a bunch of national intelligence, our national security councils, where we, we published a one-page summary with one line for each of the 10 threats, each of the 12 policies, and each of the demographics. And then we had one paragraph of, you know, big highlights, headlines, and poverty, and all this stuff. As best I can see, there's nobody in the United States of America that is publishing anything truly intelligent or useful. And if I'm wrong, please tell me. Uh, can anyone think of any information service that is useful and intelligent? <laughs> Surely you jest. Uh, <laughs> the Otto Reich NPR or the Karl Rove NPR? <laughs> All right, sir. What are your top favorite conspiracies? I have no top favorite conspiracies, but I will tell you that JFK was killed with the complicity of elements of the U.S. government. Martin Luther King was killed by an army sniper on detail to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 9-11 uh, was probably planned by the Pakistanis, and they got scared when uh, the suggestion was made that uh, one of the planes go into a nuclear plant. And so they came to Dick Cheney not expecting that he would embrace them with open arms. Uh, and I believe the Israeli Mossad told AIG and Goldman Sachs and Larry Silverstein. Uh, you do know the Mossad sent a crew from Israel to film the World Trade Center, okay? So nine different countries are on record as having told us about the 9-11 attacks coming. The FBI had two different walk-ins, one in Newark, New Jersey, one in Orlando, Florida. Uh, they blew them off because the FBI mindset is that, you know, all of these guys were, first off, they weren't all Saudis. They were different nationalities with Saudi passports. And I, I don't even know if there were hijackers on the airplanes. I mean, there's a lot that is not clear to me. But what I do know is everybody knew it was going to happen. Dick Cheney scheduled a counterterrorism, nationwide counterterrorism exercise for 9-11. He scheduled this months in advance of 9-11. You don't just call the Pentagon one morning and say, we're going to do a national counterterrorism exercise. Okay, this is months of planning from the JCS level on down. Um, so I believe... Actually, it was two weeks before. Uh, two weeks before, all of the power was turned off and the dogs were not allowed back in uh, for the two weeks between the power going out and the, and the buildings coming down. Uh, there's video evidence not only of dust after the fact of the drilling and the and placing of, of controlled demolitions, but there is also videos of all the bursts coming out. There's ample evidence now of all of the cell phone and firefighter calls of, of explosions at all levels. Um, and so I believe the day will come when we will know uh, that 9-11 was allowed to happen and was in fact, I mean, Giuliani apparently had all these trucks with GPSs ordered the night before. Okay, so this is really uh, very serious stuff. And I'm truly amazed despite all of the heroic effort of the, and, and I would emphasize that it was families of 9-11 that started questioning this not hackers and conspiracy theorists and stuff like that. Yes, jump in. Oh, yeah, lots of gold. Lots of gold, lots of diamonds. And oh, by the way, every SEC file on every investigation against Wall Street just was crisped overnight. It doesn't get any better than that. Okay. And AIG's offices could easily have been the, the end point, the control. I'm a little skeptical on all this hologram stuff. And, and faking the airplanes and stuff like that. But I do know an airplane can't go through 14 inch, uh, through steel beams that are 14 inches apart. And so the pilots for 9-11, the engineers for 9-11, the architects for 9-11, I'm one of the intelligence officers for 9-11 Truth. Um, it's, it's like Goebbels or Hitler's big lie, you know? Oh, Building 7 wasn't hit at all. And so, but it had the SEC files. Okay, so it's gotta go. What about the artifacts under Building 6? I don't think it was a plane that hit the Pentagon. I think it was a missile. Uh, I've cleaned up after airplane crashes and um, actually helicopter crashes. There's shit all over the landscape. And when an airplane goes down, you have luggage and body parts uh, and, and seats. And there were none. Okay. Um, 
All of the witnesses that said they saw the airplane were generally compromised, like the taxi driver's wife worked for the FBI. Um, it's kind of cool, really. I mean, you know, the U.S. government and everybody involved with this appears to have pulled off a major scam. Uh, and all the sheep are just going, bah! You know, so those aren't conspiracies. Those are real. Uh, the one that really pisses me off is the USS Liberty. Um, the Israelis attacked a, a USS ship that was on a listening mission and they killed and maimed a number of our sailors and then the US government told our sailors that if they ever spoke about it they would be uh, cashiered dishonorable discharges and lose their pensions. Uh, that's not a conspiracy, that's an actual fact and that troubles me. Yes sir? Well Lyndon Johnson, oh man uh, don't get me started on Lyndon Johnson in Texas. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir, ma'am, whatever. I can't see from here. <laughs> yes, uh, you mentioned um, coup d'etats, and I wanted to talk about as civil society continues to deteriorate, as the means to subsistence for more and more people is cut off, as um, unemployment rates rise, and et cetera, um, what is the possibility you see of uh, insurgent elements uh, coming out of the military, and how could that play out? And at that point, perhaps, even if you wanted to go so far, what is the proper response of the social justice movements, such as Occupy, which have attempted a nonviolent strategy, which up to now has failed? <laughs> um, Thank you. I'm pissed at Occupy. Um, first off, I've published, I did my first graduate thesis on predicting revolution. I created an original matrix, which is still as best I can tell, the best thing out there. And if you look up preconditions of revolution in the USA, you'll find my graphic. And then in red, you'll find all the ones that exist in the United States. We are absolutely in a pre-revolutionary condition. The only thing we're missing is what's called a precipitant. This is why I'm looking for a soccer mom that wants to burn herself to death on the steps of Capitol Hill. Uh, it, it, please just send your application to robertdavidsteelvivas at gmail.com. Um, your kids will be taken care of. Um, I'm sorry, that is bad, isn't it? <laughs> but you know, it's for the greater good of America. Uh, and it has to be a really busty soccer mom. I mean, you know, I mean, I want CNN just drooling as she burns up, okay? I guarantee you that will set this country on fire. <laughs> and we'll throw in a Cuban pool boy for nothing. <laughs> let, the, let the flames catch him, too. Um, Anyone got a duck? <laughs> um, I've completely lost my train of thought. Oh, okay, so, so insurgency. I think this is going to be our finest hour. Uh, you know, there's a great book uh, on doing democracy. And right now we're in stage five, which is the darkening clouds. Uh, we're in a slump, we're kind of, everything's starting to happen. We've got our apps, we can do flash mobs, we can Twitter. I hope you all saw my good not Twitter slide. Um, and our finest hour is not going to be in violent opposition to the US government. It's going to be in routing around the US government, which is to say localized resilience and growing our own food and getting off of the transportation grid and literally dropping out and, and creating communities. Um, I believe there will be a migration from the cities uh, out, into, out into the rural areas. Uh, and I believe the best thing we can do is, is, um, is not fight. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we can win a fight, but we can win a sustained strike. Um, and uh, as far as guns and gangs and all that, it's well known that the U.S. military is not only the favorite training ground for all U.S. gangs, it also, at no additional cost, trains the Taliban um, multiple times. I mean, the U.S. Army training in Afghanistan is R&R &R for the Taliban, okay? Rest and recreation. When they get hungry and tired and stuff, they come in, they swear loyalty, they get trained, uniforms, food, weapon, and then, you know, after a while they leave. Uh, and when the whole cycle starts over. Um, we're incredibly naive, or at least we were. I, I may be dated on this. Um, so I believe we're actually getting to a point now 
where the U.S., where, where, let me put it this way, the industrial era is about to collapse. And the information era, unfortunately, is represented by Microsoft, Google, and Oracle. Um, and so that's bad. Does anyone not agree with me? Facebook. Uh, I think Facebook is so far down in the dumps, it's not even worth noting. Um, and uh, Twitter is a mess. Apple. Um, Apple is cool, but Steve Jobs is still a control freak. And he's looking over your shoulder right now. Uh, <laughs> God damn it, I missed. Okay. Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, you know, I, I wrote this book. By the way, if you haven't picked up one of these little cards, where are they? Um, if you haven't picked up one of these little cards, do, do consider picking one up. Uh, it's got two URLs on the back. One is the URL for the book page uh, with a lot of free stuff, and the other is a URL for like 26 jobs, including some computer forensics jobs and stuff. Um, I, I regret that it's the first of my nine or ten books that I couldn't give away free. Um, that was the deal I had to make to get Random House to put it in bookstores. But it's the open source everything manifesto. Okay, and the problem that I have, and I love Richard Stallman, but, but he's autistic in a lot of ways um, when it comes to open source. You ever want to get him to leave the table, just start saying open source, open source, open source, open source. <laughs> Poof, he like vanishes. Um, but the, the, the thing is, I, I love him, he's a god, he's, he's, he's authentic. But the open source software people aren't talking to the open source hardware people. Uh, open BTS isn't talking to open spectrum. Uh, open data access isn't talking to open standards. Um, open government is a joke in the United States. Um, and so I believe we actually have to get to a point now where we can create an end-to-end, -end, and LibreOffice is coming along pretty nicely. Uh, we have to get to a point where we can literally say, if it's not open, I'm not touching it. Um, and I think that's the solution. Um, and, and, and this whole open source philosophy, I mean, this is a culture hack. It's not a technical hack. Uh, I love the way the Linux guys say, put enough eyeballs on it, no, no, no bug is invisible. Well, put enough eyeballs on it, no true cost is invisible. Put enough eyeballs on it. When I spoke to Gnome Dex in 2007, I told them all to, to attach themselves like stink on shit to every public official and every company and become the light on that person or that company or whatever. So I think we're getting, we're getting close to that. Um, and I've completely lost my train of thought. Maybe to clarify my question, I'll put it this way. He says that so diplomatically, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, do you believe that like, the state would simply become irrelevant or hollowed out? I mean, this is the oh, vision yeah, that now, David Graeber really, lays That's out. a really interesting, interesting, uh, I happen to like government. I think government mm -hmm. is important. Uh, McIver wrote an excellent book on, uh, on the, uh, the nature of the state, what the state is supposed to do. So the state is supposed to do the stuff, the external diseconomies or the, 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 the things that aren't profitable for corporations. And I certainly think that health should be a public service and that education should be a public service, not what it is now. Um, but where we're going is toward hybrid self-governance. Panarchy, how many know the word panarchy? Wow. Okay, you guys, go look up panarchy when you get home tonight. Um, panarchy is essentially what happens when every human mind is connected to all relevant information and all other human minds and you're able to self-govern on the fly. Okay, so there are eight tribes of information. Academic, civil society, commerce, government, uh, uh, law enforcement, military, media, and non-government, non-profit. There is no problem on the face of this planet that can be addressed with anything less than the information from all eight tribes. Okay? So government is basically coming off the tail end of an era when it could be stupid without being held accountable. And we're now moving into an era where stupid shows 
And I mentioned in the other day this Dave, uh, I love Dave Weinberger's book, Everything is Miscellaneous, and then his more recent book, uh, Too Big to Know. Um, we're now moving to a point where, and John Perry Parlow was great when he spoke at my first conference in 1992. He said the internet interprets censorship as an outage and routes around it. And that was a very inspiring thought for me that I received from him. Um, we're now getting to the point where I would say three quarters of the world economy is now routing around governments. Okay, we not only have the original traditional organized crime, which is actually now disorganized crime. In Central America, it's a come as you are game. <clears throat> and, and little groups link up and we do things and then break apart. It's not really organized in the way that we think of it. But you've got traditional organized crime. Then you have what's called System D. Okay, System D, it's a French term, and you can look it up. Uh, but System D essentially is people who are self-made entrepreneurs who will go to China and buy 15 generators and bring them back to Nairobi and sell them, and the government never knows they're there and doesn't collect taxes. Okay, so you got System D. And then you have Mitt Romney and all the offshore money. Okay, so you've got all the corporations in the United States. You've got something that's called um, import-export pricing fraud. I had a guy talk uh, a number of years back. Uh, we're losing over $50 billion a year in, in taxes to corporations that basically say that rocket engines coming in cost $25 and pencils going out cost 60 or whatever. You know, so they're, they're manipulating all of these, these things in order to avoid taxes. Um, so I would say three quarters of the world economy is no longer visible to the government. And, and that's having a painful uh, effect. So coming back to hybrid, if you take water as an example, and it's a very good example, if you take water as an example, you have to be able to pull together all of the information that academics can provide with all of their deficiencies, because academics have become stupid also. Um, but academics, civil society, I mean, Taiwan right now is giving rewards to citizens who take a picture of pollution and, and, uh, and uh, email it in. Okay, so there's all that stuff, then you've got government, honest media, like the little water newsletters and stuff like that, and then NGOs. There's, uh, Steve Denning, when he was at the World Bank, actually persuaded the World Bank that it wasn't a bank, it was an information database. And they're, they're starting to get their heads around that idea. Um, so the long and the short of it is we're, because of Microsoft, because of the way we have developed computers as basically electronic wastebaskets uh, uh, with no Dewey Decimal System and hyperlink is way behind the curve, um, we're living in a world in which 2% of the information is visible. Um, and of course, Google, you get what someone else pays for you to see, uh, which I think is pretty corrupt. Uh, you know about programmable search engines, right? So, so Google cannot be trusted at all. Um, and so I think we're getting to an era now where government is still going to be important, but if the government is not authentic and legitimate, it's going to be routed around. Uh, and I think what we have to focus now on is it doesn't matter who brings the information to the table, as long as the information is authentic and can be accepted and, and validated and acted on, then I think we're moving into an era of self-governance and we will push the envelope. Uh, people are gonna start self-organizing to get neighborhood power solutions and neighborhood water solutions. I mean, when I grew up in Asia, every house had a water catchment system and a big uh, thing of water. Um, and uh, these days, every house in New Hampshire that's built has a generator built in. Um, so government right now is a failure. Um, but I believe in government. It's, it's got to do certain important things, uh, but if it doesn't have its integrity, then it's worse than, than having a government. Uh, okay? Yes, sir? Your big argument seems get more information out there and things will sort themselves out. Um, we have to open up the information to people so they know what That's Monsanto is doing. That's a start. It's doing. not the solution. Yeah. Okay, but in a lot of cases, people are already subject to an information flood, and they already have more than enough information to make these decisions. People know about the bad acts of many corporations. They know about what's actually in their food in many cases, and yet they still eat it, even if they already know the bad things are in it. Twinkies. Sure. So there's a large portion of the population that won't 
actively do this sort of thing for themselves, and adding more information to the pile won't change anything for those people. Um, yeah, and this is where we come into visualization. Um, Peter Morville, I think, has written some excellent books, including Ambient Findability. Um, I think we need to get back to the classic comics. Um, you know, when I was a kid in the 1960s, I owned every classic comic. This is the great books. This is, you know, like, like Les Miserables is a comic book, you know. And for a 12-year-old, that was a pretty cool way of reading uh, important works. Um, it comes back to education. What we have here is this massive disconnect. First off, reality is not really that visible. Um, people don't really understand the cost. Uh, I mean, the U.S. media is censored in the sense that they're not showing the actual cost of, of depleted uranium and the actual cost of water aquifers that are dropping and, and all of this. It's, it's, like, it's like white noise. There are a number of books. I've, I've got a slide out there. If you look for graphic information pathologies, uh, you'll, get a, you'll get a slide that lists them, and each one is a title of a book, Fog Facts, Forbidden Knowledge, uh, manufacturing consent, of course, lost history, um, missing information, McKibben's book. I mean, what we have out here is this environment of information that is not making sense, and it's not being presented to people in a compelling way. Um, and so I think the next big leap is going to be in visualization, and it's going to be in personalization. Uh, I mean, Wired had a thing where it said, you know, if you point your cell phone at this thing, it says, if you eat me, I'll kill you. Well, we need to do more of that. Um, and I, th I think we're going there. So my big thing is not actually put more information out. There is a, a vast reservoir of information that needs to come out, the true cost of stuff. Uh, we need to understand the finances of every congressman in detail. I mean, because right now it's like people aren't even paying attention. But more importantly, we need to, I, I, have a, I have a chapter, if you look for 2012 preprint, The Craft of Intelligence, it's a chapter that was commissioned uh, by Routledge for a book that's coming out in February of 2013, and it's called The Routledge Companion for Intelligence Studies. And so 2012 preprint, The Craft of Intelligence, and what I talk about is the third era of intelligence. The first era was secret war, and that's what CIA is still doing. Okay. The second era was strategic analytics, Sherman Kent, only he got blown away by the clandestine service. And Harry Truman's on record in 1968 as saying he never, ever imagined CIA getting to the point where it, where it had gotten. The third era is the era that I've been beating the drum on since 1992 or so. Uh, I did a whole Earth article on ethics, ecology, evolution, and intelligence, and alternative paradigm. And then in 1995, I did an article for Government Information Quarterly on the smart nation. And so where I think we need to go is toward creating a smart nation. And if, if I were God, my dream job would be uh, Deputy Vice President or Secretary General for Education, Intelligence, and Research. And I would basically strip four-fifths of the secret budget. Uh, I would completely turn education on its head. Um, and I would have research focused on real needs for prosperity and peace, uh, because most, most research today in the United States is incoherent uh, and, and lacks purpose. I mean, DARPA, their greatest big idea is we're going to put moats all over the Arctic, uh, and they're going to send back signals on how cold it is. Uh, you know, I got an Eskimo with a cell phone that'll tell me that. Uh, so. So I think we're moving in some very interesting directions. Uh, and so I'm not about, I, I'm, I'm about public intelligence and the public interest. And, and just to kind of finalize this thought, there is the, the craft of intelligence is actually very, very good. It begins with requirements definition. You have to define what it is you want to know that will make a difference. And then collection management, you have to know who knows. Okay, you have to know where to go get it. And 80 to 90% of the information you actually need to answer an important question hasn't been published. So the acme of skill is to actually put the person with a question in touch with a human with the answer who creates the answer. Like I needed to know about the Zeeman effect for detecting underground facilities. And so I did a citation analytics, found the top 100 guys in the world, found the top 10 in the US, called the chairman of the Department of Astronomy at 
University of Illinois Urbana. I said, hey, I want to send you 2,000 bucks, um, and here's what I want you to do this weekend. And he did. Um, so that's how you really start getting good at this stuff. And then finally, you have uh, machine speed processing. In 1988, I told the General Defense Intelligence Program uh, managers, I was the Marine Corps uh, guy, and I said, hey, if you can't put geospatial attributes on every datum we collect from this day forward, this was in 1988. I also wrote the cybersecurity letter in 1994 that was ignored by the White House. Um, you can look that up as 1994 sounding the alarm. It's a great letter. I mean, Wynn Schwartow, Jim Anderson from NSA, and Bill Kiley from Australia, we said, we got to start spending a billion dollars on cybersecurity, only it has to be everybody, not just whatever. Um, and then finally, presentation, dissemination, all this stuff. So the process of intelligence is a, is a very useful, important process. And the point that I try to make to, to the secret mandarins who are tired of hearing, actually, I don't know, if I, since so few of you have heard me before, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this. I was, I was invited to speak once again by a general officer to a bunch of people. I said, aren't they tired of hearing from me? And he said, Robert, you don't understand. They haven't been listening, but this is the year I think they'll listen. Okay, so I've been doing this over and over and over and over and over again, and I keep waiting for somebody to actually listen. Um, no, I'm not actually. I found a sailboat. Um, I just have to go get it. It's in Panama. It's a, it's a, uh, I, I'm thinking about crowdsourcing it, by the way. Uh, I need $100,000 or someone with a perfect credit record, and I have the money. Um, uh, I'm serious. Uh, I'm serious. How, you know, how do you cra Well, I, there's probably, I, I know there's at least still one virgin in Kansas. So, you know, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> there is. But uh, how do you crowdsource a sailboat? You know, it's got four cabins. I could sell each cabin for 25000 uh, Each cabin has its own head. Uh, but this boat, it was built by the French in 1993. And so when I went to check it out in Panama, the doors are like, for skinny French people from back in the 1990s, okay? And this is me going in sideways uh, on this thing. Anyway, but you know what? I, I'm actually at a very calm place. I'm hitting 60 this month, and, um, and I'm at a very calm place. Um, I've, I've done what I can, uh, and I'm seeing good things. I've produced three boys that are, that are each different in their own way. Um, so we all do what we can. And... Um, and I think that, uh, I, I really honest to God think that when this country collapses, it's going to bring out the best in us. Uh, because it's going to demonstrate that the government is so totally fucked up, we need to start over. Uh, so. Well, I, the connection that I had in mind specifically, um, for example, because I had in, in mind the example of food. Food is something everyone needs, and food is something that has right. a lot of things wrong with the way it's produced. Absolutely. We waste 47% of it. But most of the people who are buying food don't really have any option to go outside of that. I mean, there are like organic farms, there's community agriculture, there's these sorts of programs, but they're all on a limited basis. And your average person who just needs to get some food to feed their family doesn't really have access to these options. So even if they have all of the education that we want to provide to them, they don't really have a choice in that matter. In and they may be too busy working and feeding their family. To but that's a business opportunity for someone like you. Uh, I'm serious. I, I think what's going to happen here in the next two or three years, I mean, I was actually, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. And, and one of them was not taking my wife's house off the grid. Um, and one of the things I discovered when I was looking out for things I could do while still being in the middle of the cesspool, Washington, um, was there's this 40, there's this 40 foot wide a bucky dome with uh, you create a pond around the sides and then there's a little pond in the middle and you can grow tilapia and then on top of the tilapia you have all these plants uh, tomatoes cucumbers whatever and the fish shit fertilizes the plants and it's like this self-contained really cool thing now where I think there's a business opportunity is becoming a block organizer who basically brings information and shows people options and then becomes the runner. Um, because I think we are going to see uh, a real need for this kind of thing. And so smart people like you could, could uh, maybe find a, a business niche, connecting, using information to connect people with a need 
with a solution that is outside the mainstream. Uh, speaking of business niches, um, could you tell us? Okay, more you got several people behind yeah, you. Yeah, quick one. Can you tell us more about the Coke can-sized nuclear weapons? Um, <laughs> catch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gordon Duff, who who is the uh, founding editor of Veterans Today, and and I have to emphasize, I believe diversity is 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 a big part of the magic. But when you're dealing with diversity, you're always going to have lunatics mixing fact and fiction and, and stuff like that. But Gordon, Gordon Duff, who, who has a lot of credibility with me in certain areas, and I'm not so sure in other areas, uh, he has written an article. And if you look up Coke can size nukes, you'll get to it. Um, but Gordon Duff, Veterans Today, uh, Coke can size nukes. And, um, I'm, I'm fairly well convinced that, that we do have miniature nukes, but I'm also more interested in the more recent story, which is about uh, the World Trade Center vaporized. I mean, not a lot of it fell down to the ground. Um, and we're talking steel beams every 14 inches. This thing was built to withstand a 747 loaded with gas. That's a good question, and I don't know the answer other than to say that a, a smart planner would plan for that. Um, I mean, just like the Pentagon had a few airplane pieces, but you know every airplane piece, no matter how small, has a number on it, okay? Uh, and the airplane pieces of the Pentagon did not track, and we've actually found a couple of the planes since then still flying. Okay, so this, I, I don't have the time to actually create a war. I mean, if I were really serious about this, this would become a war room. There would be a timeline along that wall. Uh, we would be bringing in all kinds of information. We'd be checking every single thing. We would be interviewing all the witnesses that the 9-11 Commission missed. For example, uh, George Bush without his nanny, uh, the general who was on watch. Okay, we have a half hour, and I will stop, but I will stay available to anyone who wants to have questions. Um, no, eight hours and one minute is the record. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I nearly killed myself going back. I mean, I was, I was peeing Red Bull all the way. <laughs> anyway, what's that? Now, you know, Red Bull is actually a pretty good solution. Anyway, so where were we here? You've gotten me off, off track. Um, oh, oh the, the, the general, see, what, what happened here was Dick Cheney scheduled an exercise so that he could control the government. And the FEMA Emergency Command Center for New York City was conveniently set up on the pier. They didn't use the command center that's already in the World Trade Center. That's a clue. Um, the general in charge of the National Military Command uh, Center excused himself at 8 o'clock and disappeared and didn't come back until 11. I mean, I want to know where he was. Uh, so bottom line is I am fairly convinced that Dick Cheney knew 9-11 was going to happen, that he organized a, uh, a government-wide counterterrorism exercise, that Army Pentecostals and uh, maybe Boykin uh, were a huge part of getting this stuff to happen. Uh, I'm fairly convinced that the Pentagon was hit by a missile. Uh, an Air Force Major General in uniform said on television that he was in charge of all Soviet imagery analysis and he believed it was a missile. And if you look at the Pentagon, it's a hole, okay, until it collapses. There's no parts, there's no luggage, there's no seats, there's no body parts, there's no tracks of the engines. Um, and, and some of the, the, the stuff that these airplanes are alleged to have done is beyond belief for anyone who, who, who is a pilot, and I'm not, but I've listened to pilots talk about this. Um, what's that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, see, but what, what's fascinating to me is, is those of us that read and think can pick this apart, but the larger public is just amazing. It's amazing. So go on, another question. Oh, now for something completely different. Okay. I just wonder if you have any comments on uh, the geopolitical implications of the opening of Burma to the West. Hmm. 
Discuss among yourselves. <laughs> uh, first off, Burma hasn't opened to the West. Um, I mean, well, I'm my glad impression is that it seems to be coming because there was an election held last fall that seemed, you know, to put a more democratic government in place, and that seems to be what. What? Um, you know, I, I think history has its own timeline. And, and the book that I recommend for people who really want to understand what's going on in the world is, is Ambassador Mark Palmer's book, uh, Defeating the Real Axis of Evil. I mean, it's a, it's a simple book that outlines the 44 dictators on the planet, uh, only one of whom, um, well, now Egypt, okay. So basically, there's still 40 dictators on the planet, and we still have a two-party tyranny in the United States. Uh, the United Kingdom is hosed. I mean, the, the, the city of London uh, the queen just got hit for having her money in a bank that's running drugs into the U.S. Uh, she was not happy. I mean, she go, what? I, I don't know, but whatever bank the Queen of England was using was apparently a big pusher for the dope. There's an excellent book on, on the U.K. dope uh, stuff coming into, uh, I like Progressive Press, I think it's called. Uh, they put out a number of interesting books. Um, so, uh, you know, all this stuff is out there. I, I think democracy democracy will find its way uh, but education has to come first and so I'm really I'm not looking for a silver bullet exactly but I'm really really interested in the idea that one handheld device however simple it might be can connect a person to answers and I mean some of the stuff that's being done with SMS text to get prices and stuff and then of course how many of you have heard of international crisis mapping it's absolutely spectacular Okay, Patrick Mirror is one of the geniuses of our era. And so what you have now is when Haiti happens or other things happen, all of a sudden the cell phones start texting in Swahili or Creole or whatever, and someone in the diaspora that also speaks English is then plotting this stuff onto a map. So look up international crisis mapping. That's where I think we're going in, in terms of public education and, and stuff. So let me get to someone behind you now. You seem to think that we are heading towards a revolution in America. What chance do you think the American citizens have against the most powerful army ever to grace the earth? It's not the most powerful army in the face of the earth. The Vietnamese army is the most powerful army in the face of the earth. Um, you really got to understand, and, and don't get me wrong, because I, I very foolishly turned down a backseat license in an aircraft to be an infantry officer. 4% um, of the force takes 80% of the casualties and gets 1% of the budget, okay? I mean, we're fucked. We're still using the Mattel toy. Um, the M16 is a worthless piece of shit beyond 300 meters. And there's a brilliant, brilliant war college study by a major on, on comparing that with what the Taliban is using, which is good at 750 meters. Um, we have a, I mean, the Chinese have a term for it from the Vietnam era, paper tiger, okay? We can't fucking move without having three contractors per soldier. Um, that's not a powerful army. That is an army that has forgotten how to fight. Um, it's an army that will not do well. Uh, it has not done well, coin sock. I mean, Petraeus is, is, he's a nice guy, but he's a fraud. Uh, and, and so is that Australian, the accidental American, um, Ken Cullen. Um, what's that? No, 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 we used to have Marines. Now we have Army Light, um, you know. I, and, and the Marine has, the Marine Corps has lost its integrity. I mean, General Stewart doesn't like it when I say this, but the fact of the matter is, if I were Director of Intelligence of the Marine Corps, I would be kicking the aviation general down the hall because all of the Marine Corps aircraft systems are fraudulent. They're over budget, under spec, they're, they're worthless. Um, Marine Corps has forgotten how to be honest. Uh, and that breaks my heart uh, because we used to be the gold standard. Um, but we'll see. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Thank you. I don't, I don't know. I guess I am. But. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, really, I like to say that intelligence without integrity is not intelligence, okay? And what we have in the United States of America today is zero intelligence and zero integrity. 
and 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 we all know that. Um, and I, I, you know, I have, I think, a fan base uh, inside the government. Uh, I have not been interfered with, uh, and my best sense is a third of them don't know who I am, a third of them think I'm a fucking devil, and a third of them think I walk on water and I'm a legend in my own time. Uh, I wish they'd throw money. But, um, but the reality is there is no government employee that actually wants to be an abject failure, except for all the people sitting at desks in the IRS. But, uh, you know, the reality is everyone has their pride and their sense of purpose and stuff like that. But what we don't have in the United States is leadership. Lee Iacocca wrote a wonderful book called Where Have All the Leaders Gone? And I ran for, how many of you know that I ran for president? All right. I ran for president for six weeks um, <laughs> from like November, uh, December through February, more than six weeks, okay? I was accepted by the Reform Party as a presidential candidate. I got listed on Politics One. I got interviewed for On the Issues. All of that is still up there. I created a website called BigBatUSA.org where I put all of my ideas. And I ran for president for, for three reasons. One, I was unemployed and I figured anything I could pick up from Indiegogo would be good. Uh, and I made about 1,500. Um, two, uh, I wanted to put on one website a serious presidential candidate offering. And Romney and Obama cannot match me, okay? I mean, if you want an honest president who has a brain, I'm it. Um, and it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Um, but the fact is, I can, you know, the automated payment transaction tax, a balanced budget, a coalition cabinet, uh, these, this is not rocket science. It's just common sense with integrity. Uh, but neither Obama nor Romney is capable of common sense with integrity because they are the puppets of a two-party tyranny that is, is so totally corrupt as to be an enemy of the United States of America. Um, so the second reason I ran for president was so that I could send a letter to every other presidential candidate and try to engage them. And what I learned from those exchanges is that the other candidates have varying degrees of good intention. I would say Jill Stein has the highest good intention, even though she's a deer in the headlights. Um, uh, Ron Paul is a fraud. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have to say this. His son is a dick. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> don't, don't make me go there. Uh, I'm trying to think of a variation on George Bush born with a silver foot in his mouth and Rand was born with a silver corn cob. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> it, basically he's been groomed by his dad and, and what happened, and I had a good conversation with someone from Texas the other day, uh, basically Ron Paul's been bought off. They gave him a district, they kept him happy, he's a multimillionaire. Um, He's dropping out. He did not confront Romney. He did not do what he should have done. In my view, Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich should have answered my letter and they should have sponsored an electoral reform summit and they should have gone all in to make 2012 the year in which we take this country back. It was doable. It's still doable. Because he's a worthless sack of shit with too much money and not enough balls. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, I don't mean to be mean to Ron Paul. I want Ron Paul on my cabinet. And if you, look at, if you look at the coalition cabinet that I put up, Ron Paul is slated to be the guy who closes down the Fed and that gets rewarded as uh, becoming Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, which is my revenge for Citizens United. Uh, you know, and, and I think Ron Paul would be a great Chief Justice. But he doesn't have what it takes to actually confront evil in his time. Okay? And so I, I treasure Ron Paul and I treasure Dennis Kucinich, but neither one of them is capable of being a leader because they don't have the balls to do what needs to be done right now, even though they have the gravitas and the personal standing to actually make a huge fucking difference. Imagine if Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich sponsored an electoral reform summit and got Rocky Anderson and Gary Johnson and Buddy Romer and Cynthia McKinney and Jill Stein and... and Victor whatever from the Constitution Party to show up, um, it's game over. Because there's a statement of demand, 
There is a, a 11 point electoral reform act that we all created. It's game over. We say you pass this act, which is within Congress's power. You pass this act within 30 days from today, or we're going to burn your fucking office down. Okay. This is, this is not rocket science, but I can't get anyone to listen to me. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, I'm wondering what you think about the idea that people might be able to change the world by creating groups of like-minded individuals to kind of shelter themselves from the larger society, to kind of create mini societies that are more in line with what they want out of Vermont. society. Vermont. Um, like, you know, uh, creating like intentional communities. Right, or absolutely. I love it. Do you think there's a future in that? There, that it's can, already here. Well. A, a larger future, more than just like hundreds of intentional communities that are like yes, dozens yes. of individuals, uh, of, but more like hundreds of individuals and hundreds and One of my favorite of people is Barbara Marks Hubbard, and I don't know if anyone knows this, I had to learn it from her. She was the second female vice presidential candidate with uh, Ferraro. She mm -hmm. actually came up through the floor and was a legitimate party candidate to be vice president the same year that Ferraro was the party choice. Um, she's written a book about conscious evolution. I think we're in the process of evolving. Um, and I, I believe that intentional communities are, are not only inevitable, they're, they're the only alternative. Uh, you cannot fight the U.S. government with violence, uh, particularly now that, that all the local police forces have gotten addicted to Homeland <laughs> Security money. They all have tanks. Um, <laughs> yellow tanks, did you say? They all have tanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I tanks and SWAT teams and listening devices and heat Dogs. sensors and uh, what's that? Well, yeah, the they, they're their own intelligence after a fashion. Um, Dave Cohen means well, but um, but I don't think there's a lot of intelligence in the NYPD <laughs> um, because if there were, it would be a completely different situation. Um, they're basically an industrial era police force. They're an industrial era intelligence operation. They're not a modern operation. And it really scares me to know that NYPD thinks it has the authority to shoot down an airplane and the capability to do so. Uh, so go on, please. Uh, I mean, how do you think we could start uh, enticing people into a life where you kind of give up this mainstream reality. Uh, um, I don't think you're going to have to entice them. I think they're going to come running to you uh, when? when mainstream reality fails. Well, maybe what do we do in the meantime? Because it seems to be working pretty well, or at least a lot of people seem to be happy in it. Well, here in New York City, I would start growing urban farms. I mean, it costs you know, a lot of money. What's that? It, it costs a lot of money to get real estate in New York. I mean, no, it doesn't. You, Rooftop gardens. Um, Only if you can find the right roof. Well, come on, stop making excuses. There's a well, wonderful, th wonderful there's all woman. There's this wonderful land that we no, can no, buy. No, no, but right there's right also a the wonderful woman. There's a wonderful woman, a black woman, I think, from Brooklyn, who gave a briefing at Bioneers a couple of years ago. And, and there's actually a movement to try and turn rooftops into gardens. Uh, I wonderful. think that's worth pursuing. You can also do hydroponics. There's a uh, Swedish or Norwegian outfit now that sends like a, sells a 200 buck. A rooftop hydroponics kit and so you can start growing stuff there and I'm not ready to do that uh, I'd, I'd rather do a sailboat and, <laughs> and be ready to just cast off and um, complete fisheries you see part of the problem is I've still got to put three kids through college <laughs> um, but if I can lose enough weight and live 20 years then yeah around the world is about right uh, with a sniper rifle uh, uh, for the occasional Somali pirate, uh, you know, because uh, this boat, I'm going to have a webcam and a, and a night vision thing up on the top of the mast, and you come within a thousand meters of me, you're fucking toast, okay? Uh, so, but, uh, but that's just dreaming right now, that's just dreaming. Um, but I, I, I love boats. Um, anyway, let's get the last question. I think we've got uh, 15 more minutes. And I will also tell you, I've set a new record tonight. Two hours is the longest I have ever gone without peeing. Uh, so. um, 
What are your thoughts on the United Nations Action Plan for Sustainable Development, also known as the Blueprint for Global Action, in every area where humans directly affect the environment called Agenda 21? Okay. Um, if there's any one network that is more corrupt than the U.S. government, it's the United Nations. Um, and a real part of the problem with the United Nations, I actually thought I was going to work for them for the rest of my life, and I was going to create their intelligence agency and make them smart, but that wasn't meant to be. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations has zero authority over all the specialized agencies. Okay, Those are all little fiefdoms and they're all in incestuous relations with their funders, and they're all doing things that don't work, okay? The United Nations is largely worthless in practical terms, from my point of view. It, it has a lot of great theater, a lot of gender this and gender that, uh, but it doesn't actually work. One third of the United Nations is spies, okay? Uh, working on each other. And the problem with spies using the United Nations as cover is they suck at their UN job. Another third of the United Nations is, is the, the idiot nephew of the village chief who has been brought in to have a sinecure in the United Nations, which means essentially that one third of the United Nations is actually carrying the whole thing. Okay, so the UN is, is, is a total clusterfuck. Um, now, I also think that the UN is, um, is basically theater, okay? Uh, it's like NATO in a way, although NATO's become more dangerous lately. Um, it doesn't have its own intelligence. It doesn't have its own way of getting at the facts. It's reliant on the member states telling the UN what reality is. And it really is completely out of touch with modern technology and with the possibilities. I mean, I've envisioned a global range of gifts table so that you can actually connect a person with the need with a series of people who can meet that need and you can have accountability for meeting the need all the way along. Imagine a, a farmer in Rwanda using a 1950s Romanian water pump and one of the pieces breaks. So a tourist takes a picture of that piece and uploads the need with a geospatial coordinate a Romanian engineer says, I, I have a lathe in my garage, I can build that, but I can't afford to ship it back. A German comes in and says, I will pay for the FedEx from there to there. And then someone in the capital city of whatever says, I will take receipt of the FedEx and deliver it to the village, and I will post a photo of the working pump once it's done. Okay? We're not very far from that. I mean, you've got guys doing wonderful things like, like Twittering for 200 bucks to build a well in, uh, in Africa, and the next day, uh, I hope it's not the same well that keeps appearing, but the next day, there's a picture of the well with your name on it. Okay, that's really cool. Um, so the United Nations, in, in my view, is part of the theater. Uh, if, if I were God, I would basically kick them out of town uh, and turn that place into a park. I mean, I'd get rid of the building, and I'd create a marina. Uh, right there for my boat. Uh, <laughs> you know. Well, Rockefeller gave it to the United Nations. Uh, Mic check? It's U.S. Oil. Yes, sir. Um, I'm afraid they're going to turn our country into Haiti if they've got too much power. Well, yes and no. We're not Haitians in the sense that I, I, I think there's still America the beautiful. Uh, and this is a very rich country. It's just we've been letting the crooks run the place. Um, so I, I actually don't think we're going to turn into Haiti. I think, you know what? I think we're about to have a national enema. Okay? <laughs> Sorely needed. Sir. Yeah. Okay. This was one quick comment. You're talking about, the, about making the UN smart. Making the UN smart is like trying to teach a donkey to read, okay? It's not going to happen. Yeah. All right. So get rid of them. I tell you, see, the United Nations is, is an industrial era model. It's all these stovepipes and, and very ignorant stovepipes, and there's no orchestration. See, this, what I'm working for is if you look up M4IS2, it stands for multinational, multi agency, multidisciplinary, multi domain, information sharing, and sense making. M4IS2. Um, that plus open source everything are the two things I'm thinking about these days. 
Um, drink. Um, so those are the two things I'm thinking about. And what this really boils down to is we're about to start realizing that all these experts, all these think tanks have their head up their ass. And it's time to actually get real people to connect with real facts and have real solutions that are tangible. Um, we've been sold a bill of goods. I mean, you know, all these financial derivatives, Bill Greider, 10 minutes, or is that 10 seconds? Minutes, okay. No, 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 no. I really do have to pee in exactly 10 minutes. Um, no, you look kind of threatening and menacing and, uh, you know, uh, okay. Um, so what, what I think is actually happening here is we're getting very close to the point where we can swarm a problem uh, with the right knowledge, the right mix of people, the right skills. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm actually an optimist. Uh, and I'm, I'm more, I'm not angry at the US government. Again, it's good people trapped in a bad system. Now, Jim Clapper had a chance to make me a special assistant for innovation, but I guess I scared him. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, but I think it's gonna happen anyway. And my chapter, 2012 preprint, uh, the craft of intelligence is as good as I can get on where I think we're going. And I will tell you, the future of intelligence is not federal, not secret, not expensive. It's us. Um, so I'm, I'm actually feeling pretty positive. It's too bad digital, pay, uh, digital money doesn't burn. Um, I personally think, uh, I mean, John Raymer did something with Intera. I personally think we should move all money into community banks. All money should be asset-based. Um, all loans should be local. All absentee landlords should suffer eminent domain repossession. Um, and I basically believe that we're going to start bartering in a very sophisticated way. Uh, and we're going to start putting money out of business. Uh, so, for example, there are people that are now buying uh, a season's crop, you know, of mixed things. So, I, 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 yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I really, I really, uh, it's giving me a hard on just thinking about this. You know? <laughs> it's not you. And I'm not looking at you. I'm not looking at you. I'm, I'm looking at the babe that just flashed me from the back. Okay. <laughs> All right. How about one more question and then we'll break up? Um, there's, there's one more guy behind me. Yeah, so no, I'm two. not rushing you. Okay. Okay. Two more questions. Um, mine's pretty simple. Well, not, I don't know. What do you think about like, um, pop music and like the mechanisms of control um, or I don't, I don't know what do you I think music is both a control measure and a liberating feature uh, one of the stupidest things we've done in schools is shut down uh, art and music uh, because that is actually part of the creative process um, and um, I, I, I don't know I mean I I, I, I really, my, my third son likes country and western, which was a huge surprise to me. No, 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 no. Come on, Patsy Klein singing crazy? Uh, I mean, you know, that is... All right, okay. Uh, next question. Hello. All right. I am a product of the broken American university system. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that America has historically maintained their disparity. America has always raped the land. They've always pillaged. The reason America were essentially separatists who did not want to pay a tax. America kept the door open, you know, in World War II. America has never been a good guy. So are you saying that America is as we are today, is a result of a select few in office? Is it not the result of its people who put them there? Is it not a result of everyone in this room? Are we not at fault for the sins of our country? Yes, and, and I like the point that you've made. It's, it's a very important point because I, I tell people that if we don't impeach our government, then the rest of the world should hold us accountable. Um, and, and the crimes that, that Bush, Cheney, and, and Obama, Biden, um, but it's not about the government. It's about our people. It's, it's well, a fundamental mindset, which yeah, we have. It is. We, it's we, wrong. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So and then we genocided the Indians, 
and we've totally fucked over the blacks, and now we've totally fucked over the whites. So now we'll have a revolution. <laughs> so it took us, so we, so we finally had to fuck ourselves before we could finally fuck. realize how fucked we were. <laughs> I don't want to watch that. Um, it's happening, though. Everyone in no, this no, room. You may, you, well, yes and no. You, you know, can say I mean, how smart we are. You can say, you know, we're smart. Everyone else is stupid. No, but, actually, a taxi driver in South Africa knows more about this country than most people in the I United States. It. I believe it. Um, no, look, I, 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 I can't, you can't get me mad at the USA. Um, I'm pretty pissed I, off I, at I'm the shocked, USA. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked and I'm ashamed of a lot of things, but the, the actual heart of this country, I think, is very, very good. Um, and uh, Washington is not at all representative. Wow. What? We were founded on disparity. We were, we okay, were take, take it outside. Take it outside. Next question. Okay. I, uh, I like your shout out for Vermont, which is where, uh, yeah, I guess it's my adopted home state now. I bank at a local bank. It's a co-op. They, they, they do a lot of house loans. Uh, I've shaken the hand of the senator uh, that represents me, Bernie Sanders, great guy. But see, I'd, I'd vote for him for president. Oh, yeah, but I'm sure. he needs the coalition cabinet yeah. and all this other stuff, so, and he doesn't want to be bothered. So, uh, yeah, so Vermont's a great place, but uh, everybody else, don't go there. There's a lot of black flies. It gets cold. You know, you, you don't, you don't want to go there. <laughs> okay, but my question... <laughs> My question is, just as when the Soviet Union was dissolving, one of the big questions is, who's got control of the nukes? <coughs> if well, the United States goes through a similar process, who's got control of the nukes and the other well, really dangerous Well, I have dangerous good news for you. There's assets. never been an operational test of a nuclear weapon in the United States of America. Most of them will not work. Um, and the second half of that good news is that I really rely on the common sense of the people around them. Um, I am less worried about loose nukes than I am about loose presidents. Uh, that was really the point of my question. Yes. You know, we have to stop now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the bathroom and then I'm going to come back out to that other room and, and answer any questions that anyone wants to ask. To the video temple? Okay. I'll do whatever you say. So I'm going to be on the, I'm, after I go to the bathroom, I'm going to be at the video temple on the second floor for an hour. Uh, yeah. Okay. We good with that? Um, let me just say God bless you all. I, I truly love being here. Um,